Okay. Um, so we're back with Q and A. This is Restoration Fellowship. I'm here with Sir Anthony, and uh, this is our website, focusonthekingdom.org. If you want to find out about us. So good evening, everyone. Today is October the twenty fourth, Tuesday. And um, let's see, so we're here talking to you from uh, the south of Atlanta, Georgia. So Anthony, we're streaming now on uh, Facebook. If you wanna mm -hmm. leave comments, so usually how this works, if you're visiting, we go through uh, questions Sir Anthony gets during the week. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, time permitting, you can uh, post them if you're joining us on the Zoom. You can uh, type them on the Zoom uh, channel. Or alternatively, if you're on uh, Facebook, you can leave uh, your comments there. Also visit our other website, thehumanjesus.org. All things to do with Christology, the study of the Messiah. And uh, we got articles there still from this month about the root and descendant, a quote from uh, Jesus and the Victory of God book, or tome, I should say. I think that's about a 600-page book, I think, Anthony, that mm -hmm. T. Wright Probably. book. <laughs> yeah, it was good, good to read. Wright is a good scholar in many, many ways, although not clear on the kingdom, but he has lots to offer. And the God of Jesus book by Keegan, uh, must Sunday. have about must have mm -hmm. so all right do you want to start with uh, a precursor to our q a tonight uh yes i think so because uh, reflecting on the many questions we've heard during the week this is my impression you see we are truth seekers i happen to be trained in in the theological college i was at, at uh, bethany seminary at oxford before that and so I'm coming at this from uh, an academic point of view, but also believing. So I would have to say to you that many scholars get good facts, but they don't believe. So there's a limitation there. I'm a naive believer. If it says such and such a scripture, I'm going to believe that. However, I would warn people, if you are not in any way a scholar, if you don't know a word of Greek or Hebrew, you may have some limitations. It doesn't mean you cannot be a good Berean, but you should pay attention to what the professionals in the field are saying too. doesn't mean you have to believe them, but you shouldn't be ignorant of that. I hear people sometimes saying that their opinion is such and such on a Greek word, but they don't have any competence to say what a Greek word means unless they've got good software as well. Using a Strong's Concordance will not do it. Using the King James only will do it much less. So it's a good combination of different factors that'll get you, I think, on board. And so the questions we're answering are our best attempt to do that doesn't guarantee that they're right, but they're for you to think about. Okay, so again, if you're on the Zoom, you can, uh, one of the things about Zoom webinar, you can interact with us. There's a little hand button at the bottom, a raise hand, uh, if you want to interact with uh, Sir Anthony. And by that, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we can see you and hear you. If you're on Facebook, you can just uh, leave a, a text a message there or a, or a question. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Anthony, we'll go through, let's see, we'll go through one of the first questions here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'll put it up. I have heard many believe that the resurrection will happen prior to Jesus' return, judgment, and return to Jerusalem. Do you have a timeline I could reference? Yeah, that's interesting. It's not quite clear what you mean by prior. And so we'd have to clarify that to make the question clear. If by prior you mean seven years earlier, that's completely false. There's only one second coming. It's one event. There are not two parousias. I'm going to use the Greek word parousia to indicate the one and only second coming of Jesus, his arrival, advent, his presence with us personally and visibly, it's one event. If you mean prior a few minutes earlier or so, the fact is that at 
the arrival of Jesus, he will immortalize the saints as he descends in the air in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, in 1 Corinthians 15, he will immortalize the faithful of all the ages. That's to say Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets and all the true believers, whoever they turn out to be, will be immortalized at the parousia as Jesus is coming down. And then Jesus will begin to organize the kingdom, probably out in the wilderness for a while, possibly those extra 45 and extra 30 days in Daniel 12. Daniel is the key book to most of the Bible, along with the teachings of Jesus. And so he'll probably organize the theocratic kingdom, God's kingdom, and then he will march on Jerusalem from the east going to the west and take over from the Antichrist, who will have been dominating the scene for the previous three and a half years of that final seventh uh, heptad, 70th heptad, I should say, the last three and a half years of that final seven years. And then the kingdom of God will begin, but it won't all happen in one day. You're not going to convert the entire world. The scene will then be Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar at the arrival of Jesus? And God laughs at these silly people. He says, don't be stupid. I've put my son on my holy hill, which is Jerusalem, on the earth. Why don't you listen to him and get real? Give in to him. He'll tell you what to do. It's wise to obey the Son at any point, and especially at that dramatic moment when Jesus comes at his one single post-tribulational parousia and sets up the kingdom on the earth. So does that cover the ground? If, it's, if I've left out something, let me know. Yeah, actually, uh, let's see. Let, let's give some scripture here to the questioner. Um, mm. Let's see. Paul gives a pretty good uh, sequence here, Anthony, in 1 Corinthians 15. Mm. If you can uh, go through this. So let's see, verse 22, For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each mm -hmm. in his own order, Christ the first fruits. then when Christ comes, those who belong to him, yes. then he. comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has brought to an end all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So this is a sort of truncated uh, timeline here. Oh, yes. As long as we understand the end there is the end stage of the resurrection in that context. Paul is a pre-mill. He believes in the pre-millennial kingdom. Jesus, of course, confirmed that absolutely in Revelation 20. So he comes, Jesus dies, and 1 Corinthians 15, 23 is when I would teach all the children, and if you're preaching, preaching it every Sunday. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Those who are Christians will be given immortality at the parousia of Jesus. That's absolutely crystal clear. It's the same as the end of the age. In the question of the disciples, what will be the sign of your coming? In Matthew 24, verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, your parousia and end of the age? That's one idea. If you want to be technical, one article combines those two events. If only people would simply stick with that. The parousia is the resurrection of the faithful. Is Daniel 12, verse 2? That's easy. We must get hold of the meaning of these basic terms. If you're listening to a lecture on the USA and you think it's about the United Stamp Association, you're not going to get far. The problem with most people is they've not sat down and analyzed the words of the Bible. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom always. It's the word of the kingdom. It's the word. It's the word of God. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The end of the age is the parousia, is the resurrection of the faithful. Then he rules on earth for a thousand years. He's destined to do that, Paul said there. At the end of the thousand years, there'll be a final rebellion of Satan, as you know. And then comes the general resurrection of all the rest of the dead. Revelation 20 verse 5 is key. All the rest of the dead did not get resurrected at the parousia, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 23, I just mentioned. All the rest then will come alive and they'll be judged on a different basis. Many of them have never heard of Jesus. So their, built, their, based, uh, their judgment has to be based on what they reasonably could know. That's Romans 2 and the wider hope, if you like. People who've never heard of Jesus and many others can only be assessed and judged on what they could reasonably have known. That's where Jesus, you know, in John 15 says, if I had not come and told you, then you wouldn't be guilty. 
So as we are exposed to truth by whatever means God chooses to reveal it to us, then we become responsible for what we are hearing. To whom much is given, much is expected. That's entirely fair uh, judgment and justice. I think we'd all agree. Right. And as for a timeline, uh, yeah. you can go to our focus on the kingdom.org under articles, click on articles, and then go down to the gospel of the kingdom. And you'll see this, mm -hmm. the Christian good news chart, which we posted. Yes. And uh, you click on that and you should see this, uh, which is a chart. Amazing. There so we you have. Bring that up. Incredible. And there you got a, a hopefully a simple timeline, Anthony, that you created mm -hmm. a while back. Mm -hmm. Yep, well back. Use that in class. Uh, while we're at it, Carlos, in the November 2016 focus, all the back numbers of the focus on the kingdom are there at our site. In November of 2016, I had an article there about have you heard the gospel? We've got a mass of stuff on that. That's particularly interesting, have you heard the gospel? Because many of us had not heard the gospel until we began to see that the gospel is always about the kingdom of God. One cannot say that often enough because much of evangelicalism actually rejects that gospel. People don't even know this, but there are many evangelicals who say that the teaching of Jesus in the gospels is not for us. C.S. Lewis made the ultimate gaffe from my angle when he said that the gospel is not in the gospels. It doesn't get any worse than that, to use the popular phrase. The teaching of Jesus is the basis on which you're going to be judged, and of course, Jesus spoke in Paul. So it's Jesus plus Paul. Not a half-baked, rejected Jesus and a twisted Paul. That's the danger. Start with Jesus, work through his teachings, which are for us. He spoke to Jewish disciples, but they're the apostles, and therefore they are our mentors. We have to join that apostolic church founded by Jesus. Paul then developed certain things beyond that, under the inspiration of Jesus, that's right. But unless you get that system clear, you're going to be systematically be deceived, and that's not going to help you with Bible study, I think. Right. So once again, uh, focus on the kingdom.org. You can go to the focus on the kingdom magazine, and yes. you can click on November 2016, and you can read that article uh, Anthony mm -hmm. has up there, which is there as a PDF, have you heard the gospel? Right. Okay, so that's the first question about the timeline. Actually, uh, since we have a bit of time here, let, let's uh, comment a little bit about the chart. So basically, we're in the pre what Paul calls present evil age in Galatians 1.4. So that's what we're living in mm -hmm. right now. If you don't, if you hold to some kind of preterist or historicist view, mm. it's very hard not to believe reality that this is a evil age with all the stuff going on. Mm. I don't know, just mm. watch the six o'clock news. So we're uh, <laughs> in this timeline here, if you can see the chart. And then at some time in the future, remember we're not date setters, uh, a sequence of events will begin uh, and the, um, the, the clock, as it were, the apocalyptic clock is, is uh, always the Middle East. So events in the Middle yeah. East uh, will happen. Uh, there has to be a Antichrist figure who mm -hmm. is raised up. There has to be a temple because mm -hmm. Jesus talks about the desecration of the holy place in Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, sets off the final week of the 70th week prophecy that right. uh, Daniel is very important, as he stated. You have to really look at Daniel to understand Matthew 24. Daniel's key. So do you, have, Daniel do, you have the, mm -hmm. do you have all the verses mm -hmm. there, all these citations? So hopefully that will help you. All right, let's get to the next one, Anthony. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
was the logos, that's the word, or God's pnefma, spirit, thought of as a mm. second distinct person apart from Yahweh, God, before the early church mm. fathers like Justin Martyr? Mm. That's a great question. The answer is no, not by anybody who's responsible to the Bible. Now, Philo is, is very complicated. I don't even recommend you read him. Uh, he might have thought of the logos, which is more or less interchangeable with Pnevma there, if you like, as a person, as a son pre-existing, but I'd leave Philo well alone. He's a horrible mixture of Greek philosophy and the Hebrew Bible, don't need him. But does anybody within the biblical sphere think of the Logos as a separate person? Absolutely not. And I'm happy to tell you that the scholars at Oxford are very clear on this particular subject. I'll just read you a line or two from Dr. Caird, who was the Regis Professor of a Biblical Exegesis, that's Biblical Explaining, at Oxford University. He says this, how is John 1.1 1, 1 to be translated? And I'm quoting from Caird, Professor of Oxford, uh, at Oxford, his book on theology. How is John 1.1 1, 1 to be translated? The solution is, he says, that Logos for John Primarily means purpose. That's right. In the beginning was the purpose, the purpose in the mind of God. I'm quoting now, the purpose which was God's own being. It reflected God's own being. Because your words reflect who you are. As a man thinks, so is he. You are your word, if you like. That's what John is saying there. It then goes on to say, uh, quoting Professor Kerr from Oxford again, it is surely a very conceivable thought that God is wholly identified with his purpose of love, and this purpose took human form in Jesus of Nazareth. That's brilliant. I think that's exactly right. There's no pre-existing son. Do not read John 1, 1, as if it said, in the beginning was the capital word. It doesn't say that. There are 50 translations, in fact, which don't say him. They say it, and that's perfectly legitimate because logos is an it. Until it becomes Jesus, then it's a he. But it doesn't become Jesus, the logos, until Jesus is born, when he begins to exist. Then you've got a human being who is the Logos, the embodiment of the purpose and mind of God. The gospel, if you like. In the beginning was the gospel, God's immortality plan. It was with God. Because in Hebrew thinking, something that's with you is your baby, if you like. It's the thing that you treasure. It's your purpose, your mind, your intention. And it then became the man Messiah in John 1.14. That's beautiful. Once you say in the beginning was the Son, you've then unfortunately contradicted Matthew and Luke absolutely flat. You've made nonsense out of them. And you now have to deal with a second divine person. And originally, Justin Martyr simply said, this was a son begotten sometime before Genesis. That's chaos enough, but it got worse than that. Gradually, as the Trinity developed, they began to say that there was a God, the Son, co-equal with the Father. And that's the cause, I think, of a great deal of our agony and problems. Again, the top scholars know, one for instance says, that no responsible scholar says the Trinity is in the Bible. That's a strong statement by a lifelong expert, Hansen. Another one, uh, Dean Matthews, who wrote in the Telegraph in London when I was growing up every Saturday, he said, everybody with a rudimentary knowledge of history even an elementary knowledge of history knows that the Trinity has nothing to do with the New Testament. That's right. No, Jesus was a Jew. When asked about the greatest commandment, he simply recites the Shema. The Shema is a non-Trinitarian creed. Ask any Jew. This is the embarrassing thing for churches, that while clutching the Bible and proclaiming loudly sola scriptura, they in fact are not doing sola scriptura when it comes to defining God. This is what has to change, and you have to help people by writing to the newspaper, talking to the pastors, engaging whomever you can on that critical issue of getting the first commandment right. And Jesus then is the Messiah, the Son of God. But pre-existent word should have a little w, it should be an it. All things are made through it. By it was nothing made that was made. That it then became a he when Jesus began to exist. That is simplicity itself, I think. Right. Um, so... I, I think the answer is no to both. Uh, yes, you have Philo, but again, uh, you yes. you have the so-called two powers heresy of Judaism, uh, detailed mm -hmm. by, uh, I forgot the book 
to to look at for that. But yeah, th there were Seagull strength. probably Seagull. Seagull, uh, two powers in heaven. The, there was undoubtedly a strain of uh, uh, weird ideas mm. uh, in, in within Judaism before uh, Christian mm. times, but the mainstream of Judaism did not uh, have these uh, two things, the word and the spirit of God as two separate distinct, let alone a trinity. I mean, there was no trinity before at least I would say the so-called Athanasian Creed of 800 AD. Uh, so uh, the other thing, Anthony, is to note, as you noted, uh, you, you went by it, but it's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, under, again, to the focus on the kingdom, uh, this is a, a wealth of stuff here, folks. So just go to articles mm -hmm. uh, under Jesus, and you'll see John 1 in 50 plus... English yes. translations. You click that, yes. and, and this is a very good article you mm -hmm. posted a while back. And mm -hmm. you note all the English verses, uh, versions, all the English mm -hmm. translations prior to the King James. Yes. In uh, 1602, 11. I believe. 11? 1611, it's the King James. Oh. King James is 1611, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you, you'll note this, what you mentioned that. Uh, it, actually, can I ask you, why do you think all these, uh, a lot of them Catholic translators yeah. And, yeah. and some Protestants translators, yeah. why do you think yeah. they had no issues rendering logos as an it, as you can see here? Time well, and time because they were smart enough students to know that that's what it meant. And being Roman Catholics, they could wear two hats, which I can't do. They could say, well, if you ask me what the Pope says, I'll give you this answer. If you ask me what John said, I'll give you a different one. I don't think that's honest. They will have to deal with that in the judgment. However, they're good scholars. And as you say, they fully well knew that Logos is a masculine gender grammatically. And this is what the public doesn't always know. Grammatical gender is not the same as sexual gender necessarily at all. The table is feminine in French and many examples. But Logos is masculine gender grammatically. But your word is not another person. Your word is you expressing yourself. Uh, actually, James Dunn, and here's a, a good example of books that you should read. If you really want to know this stuff well, read James Dunn's uh, Uni Unity and Diversity or his Christology in the Making. They're must-reads for anybody who wants to be a teacher in this field. And James Dunn says that Christ is being identified in John 1 not with a pre-existent being, but with the creative power and action of God. There is no indication, says James Dunn in his Christology in the Making, page 254, 254, there's no indication that Jesus thought or spoke of himself as having pre-existed with God prior to his birth. Most interesting. Absolutely. The thing is to start with Matthew and Luke, who gave full chapters to explain how Jesus began to exist. So once you start saying he was really Michael the archangel or pre-exists as God the Son, you're contradicting Matthew and Luke. I don't want to risk that. Start with Matthew and Luke and then see what the options are in John and it all becomes rather easy. Right. Um, and it's also interesting uh, to note, Anthony, that uh, when I did a little research on the Spanish in yep. the history of the Spanish translations, all the Spanish translations prior mm -hmm. to the 1602 Reina Valera rendered uh, the word in, in Spanish, it's palabra, mm -hmm. as such, as palabra. Mm -hmm. En el principio era la palabra. And, and the reason that's important is because when the Reina Valera changed it to verbo, which mm -hmm. is uh, another masculine uh, uh, gender. Newton, uh, Newton in German. Right. Yeah, sorry, so, Newton in Latin. In Latin. Right, Newton. in Latin. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the reason that's important is because when the translators before the Reina Valera properly rendered logos as palabra instead of verbo, verbo is verb. Mm -hmm. It's like English, you know. That's not even a, a right <laughs> translation of, of the logos. No. Logos in Spanish is mm -hmm. palabra. And the reason mm. that's important is because 
uh, it's followed by um, uh, she. Mm -hmm. uh, ella era en el principio, which means she was in the beginning, literally in English. So obviously there's no sun there, right? So yeah. that, that's what happened with the... And then just one last thing about the early church fathers, about the question, uh, Justin Martyr was really the one of the pioneers of the so-called pre-existence. Mm -hmm. But this is how bad it got, Anthony, by the, by the what, fourth, third, fourth century, you have St. Yeah. Athanasius writing, yes. the womb in which Christ was begotten was not the corporeal womb of Mary, but refers to the eternal begetting of the Son by the Father. Christ cannot be called a son and a creature the two are contradictory. That's an amazing quote. <laughs> That's absolutely flat out wrong, false. Because Matthew one twenty says that the one begotten in her, the translation is conceived sometimes, it's, it is a conception, but the Greek says begotten there. Again, Matthew 1 verse 20. That which is begotten in her, and Athanasius said the precise diametrically opposite there. This is how bad it is. That's just false. Unfortunately, that became the tradition, and today it's regarded as orthodox. And woe betide you if you don't believe in orthodoxy. Well, Matthew 120 contradicts Athanasius there flat out. More than false, um, it's, it's, uh, Pernicious. it's blasphemous because he is called mm. son, yes. and Paul actually calls him a creature in Colossians 1. <laughs> so. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, uh, folks, if you got any questions, uh, again, just post them on, if you're watching on Facebook, you can leave a comment. If you're on the Zoom, the benefit of the Zoom webinar is you can interact with Sir Anthony, just raise your hand. There's a little hand button at the bottom and, and you can uh, interact with us. Next question, Anthony. So we're going through the questions first. Are we born sinful? Are we inclined to sin by nature? So we have uh, Psalm 51, 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And Romans 7, 27. Uh, maybe that's wrong. Anyway. That's not right verse. Right. right. Sorry, verse. folks. Not the right verse. Psalm 51. So are we, uh, I think this is the original sin question. I suppose so, and people make a huge fuss about nothing with respect to the questioner here. Uh, Romans clearly says that Adam sinned, and we've all sinned because Adam sinned. We all sinned. Of course we do. We're born into a world that's sinful, and we learn how to sin very early on, but it's the act of creation or begetting or, or the producing of a human being is not sinful in itself, of course. That's just nonsense. The creative act of producing human beings is not sinful. But yes, the world is sinful. The devil is the god of this age, and we learn how to sin. But Paul makes nothing of this. That's enough. You don't need more than that. I know that in me dwells no good thing, Paul said. That's enough. In my flesh, just as to say, my unconverted me, the unconverted part of me that lingers on, despite the opposite uh, power of the spirit that Christians must have, Paul makes no fuss of that. We know that that's true, and we are tempted on every side and Jesus was likewise, but he was not sinful. We do make mistakes, of course. We do sin. Nobody is sinless this side of the resurrection. But I don't think one needs to say more than the Bible does, and it's very brief. It's enough. It's quite clear that the human heart is deceitful above all things. That's in Jeremiah somewhere. I've forgotten the verse now. The human heart is naturally deceitful, twisted. We learn this very early on. And really, I think that's quite enough. The original sin doctrine caused all sorts of problems because it very soon developed into the idea that reproducing children was itself sinful somehow. We don't need any of that. So stay with the very few verses that deal with this and recognize, as Paul said, I know that in me, that's to say, he said, in my flesh, the unconverted part of me, no good thing dwells. That's it. That's enough. How do we understand that in light of uh, the man Jesus, Anthony, who we believe had no sin in him? Um, right. How, how do we apply that that natural 
a fallen state of the flesh in relation to Jesus. Well, he, he was had that too. He was tempted exactly as we are. He certainly had sin in that sense. He never sinned, but he did have the sinful tendency. Otherwise, that's a nonsense statement, right? He was tempted in every point just as we are. So the sinful nature certainly worked against him all the time, never yielded to it. So he's the perfect example of a man who does not yield to sin. But yes, he had the tendency to sin, of course. Otherwise, he wouldn't have any kind of a role as model for us. But that text in Hebrews is absolutely definitive, isn't it? He was tempted in all points right. as we are, yet without sin. That's beautiful. That's very That's easy, too. Hebrews 4.15, we yes, do not have a high great. priest who is unable right. to empathize with our weaknesses, but, right. he, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Mm. Uh, some paraphrase this in all points. <laughs> yes, same thing. Just as we no are. Problem. And this yes. is an interesting Christological mm. point. Well, more than interesting, this is an essential part of Christianity yes. that in order for Hebrews, the Hebrews writer here, mm. to be speaking truth, Jesus uh, had to be a full human being. No half measures. I mean, because we cannot empathize with a pre-human Jesus, let alone a God-man Jesus, can we? Or can you? No, of course not. Of course, the, the writer to Hebrews, whoever it was, and it doesn't matter, it's part of Scripture, is very keen to point out that Jesus was never, ever, ever, ever an angel. So anybody claiming that Jesus was an archangel, Michael, has really got to confront that text right now before the judgment. God never, ever said to an angel, you're my son to dad begotten. He said it to the human Jesus. So that non-angelic Jesus is very important. But worse than an angel Jesus would be a competing God Jesus. I was reading today a, a, a site on, on the internet where they were saying that the son is Yahweh and the father is also Yahweh. Well, that makes two Yahwehs. Your child knows that. Two X's is not one X. We need to straighten these things out, this side of the judgment, because those of us who teach are going to be held highly responsible for such illogical statements as saying that Yahweh is the name for the Father. That part is correct. Yahweh is not the name for the Son. That would make two Yahwehs. That breaks the first and great commandment in Mark 12, where the Shema, the unitary monotheistic creed of Israel, is fully approved by Jesus and confirmed as the greatest commandment. That's not so hard. Two will never be one. We don't need mathematical uh, double talk to try to get our theology over. No need for that. All right. Uh, next question here on the agenda. Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, before we get on to the next one, let, let me read those important uh, mm -hmm. verses in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, for to which of the angels uh -huh. did God ever, mm -hmm. as you say, ever, ever <laughs> ever say. say you are my son today i have begotten or become your father yes or again i will be his father he will be my son and again yes. just in case <laughs> we're not clear when god brings his firstborn into the world he says let all god's angels worship him worship some, him some understand this as the virgin birth Anthony, i don't know if you do Verse yes, six. of course, when he brings him into the world, he did it by miracle. That's easy. And Acts 13.33 quotes the Psalm 2 verse about today, I've begotten you, of the coming into existence of Jesus. And verse 34 speaks of the resurrection. Translation is very misleading, the King James there. Acts 13.33 shows us how to use that verse. Today I've begotten you. And then in verse 34, now let me give you something else he says. As for the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, as to think from just put on the human history scene, which is raising up, as he did with David, in verse 33. Then 34 talks of the resurrection. We have an article on that at the site, too. It's a very important distinction. He was begotten in the womb, Matthew 1, 20, Luke 1, 35, because of the miracle, Luke 1, 35, because of the miracle in Mary. The one begotten, the one brought into existence in the womb is the Son of God. That ought to be clear enough. It's not very difficult. It wasn't meant to be difficult. 
And uh, regarding verse 6 there in Hebrews 1, I found a very interesting um, uh, article in one of the first uh, Watchtower uh, publications. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, 1879. Mm. They, they used to call it Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Mm. So this was in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, this, the editor of this was uh, C.T. Russell, by, by the way. Yes. Mm. And uh, it says in part, Anthony, I'll just mm. get down to the verses here. Hence, yes. it said, let all the angels of God worship him. That must include yes. Michael, the chief mm. angel, hence Michael, is not the son of God. Oh, that's so this, a fantastically interesting statement because somebody told us the opposite <laughs> just the other day. Well, isn't this, this isn't exactly Russell. This was written by a, a fellow called John Patton, P-A-T-O-N. Okay. He was yeah. a very prolific um, writer of yeah. the early days of the magazine. Ah. But the editor yeah. was Russell nonetheless. That's so. a, it Very had, significant. It had his point. blessing. And of then course. later it says Michael or Gabriel are perhaps perhaps uh, grander names than Jesus, mm. though Jesus is grand in its very simplicity. Mm -hmm. But the official character of the Son of God as Savior and King is the inheritance mm. from his Father, which is far superior to theirs. <laughs> so, yeah, they obviously changed their... Uh, their views there later on but later on they did but that's a very interesting statement you cannot be michael if you're jesus that's to say no more sensible than saying that john is really james they're not you can't be two persons the archangel michael is an angel he's a super angel a leading angel and that text that you just put up for us from hebrews and we need to keep that statement by the way readily available all the time but it says, to which of the angels? The answer is this rhetorical question, of course. The answer is, of course, none. Don't even imagine it. Don't go there. Don't dream. Don't imagine. Don't speculate on Jesus being an angel, because that's ruled out emphatically by that question there. Okay, um, we got a couple more questions. If hmm. you want to... Leave a question, or if you want to interact with us, like I said, just click, if you're on the Zoom, click on the little hand button at the bottom there. All right, the mm -hmm. next one, uh, it's regarding a text in James, James 5 to 7. James 5, mm -hmm. verses 7 and 9. Is this saying that Jesus would come within his generation? I think uh -huh. it's within the generation of James. So let's see what James says. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's return. Think of how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the ground and is patient for, for it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient and strengthen your mm. hearts, for the Lord's return is near. Yep. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge stands before the gates. Oh, that's uh, so, obviously yeah. completely out of the question that anybody in the New Testament ever, ever said the second coming would be within 30 years or 40 years of their talking. That's just wrong. The word yenea there in Matthew 24 doesn't mean race. That would be yenos. Yenea means uh, in that context society because he repeats it in the next line where he says, Jesus did, heaven and earth will pass away. The present world order will pass away. So within this present world order nobody has any idea when jesus will come back until the warning signs begin to occur that was the question jesus was asked, what asked there in matthew 24 what is the sign of your parousia matthew 24 3 and the end of the age that's one idea and he gave a number of signs this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in the entire world in verse 14 of matthew and then the end of the age will come. We're not talking about AD 70. That was not what they were asking about there in Matthew 24. Not at all. What will be the sign of your coming, which they assumed would be at the same time as the destruction of Jerusalem, and that's probably right too. The assumption is the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the age coincide. Jesus did not correct that. 
There's no place in Matthew 24 where you can suddenly say, well, now he's talking about 70 AD and now he's talking about the end. It's a seamless account. And certainly uh, nobody in the New Testament attempted to set a date that would be completely wrong. So uh, I don't know if that deals with the question, but uh, well, yeah, I don't think they imagined 2,000 years. That's true. I don't think they imagined 2,000 years, certainly. But right. Certainly um, James, I, I think the questioner, um, because of the immediacy of James' words here, yes. he says uh, mm. that Jesus is standing at the, at the door, at the gates. Yes. Yes. And yes. Uh, also, uh, let's see. Uh, he, the Lord's return is near. Yeah. So, the, so there's always this uh, near but not here, as they say, mm -hmm. language uh, mm -hmm. about Jesus, isn't there? Absolutely. He says, I'm coming quickly because he's standing there. John, or Jesus, who gave the book of Revelation. By the way, it's the revelation of Jesus given to John. When he says, I'm coming quickly, he's in vision there. He was in the Lord's day, transported. And the New Testament always stands on the brink of the kingdom of God to come. And it's as though it's just over, over the horizon. But in fact, Jesus clearly said, only when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he, it's a masculine pronoun, in Mark 13, 14, where he ought not to, then you flee, then will be the great tribulation. So the key to all of this is the great tribulation. There's never been a time like it. There will never be a time like it afterwards. It's unique. There's only one great tribulation. It's unique. That's what Jesus clearly said. And he's citing Daniel 12, verse 1. All you have to do is to go to Daniel 12, verse 1, and you find that immediately after the death of the Antichrist, or in connection, not immediately after, but in connection at the same time, the death of the Antichrist, then you get the Great Tribulation. And guess what? In verse 2, the resurrection. That's easy. Always remember in your study, the resurrection is the same as the parousia. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. That's a fixed datum. So when you find the resurrection, as you do in Daniel 12, 2, and at that time you find the great tribulation, that's future. It's just before the second coming. That's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24, Mark 13. He said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the great tribulation. In Mark's version, in those days after that tribulation, not another one. You can't have two great tribulations. It's a brief period of time in which it's going to be very tough on pregnant women. That's not 2,000 years. Matthew 24 is easy if you don't throw away the base in Daniel. If you do, then you're making it all up and you're in chaos. So Daniel 12, 1, 2, and 3, three verses consecutively, all of which Jesus loved and quoted. Daniel 1, he quoted it in Matthew 24, 21. Daniel 2, he quoted it referring to the resurrection all the time. Daniel 12, 3 says, their faces are going to shine like the sun in its strength. And that is exactly Matthew 13, 43, which Jesus loved. Talking of the future kingdom, the harvest, the end of the age. So you must get your vocabulary placed right. Otherwise, it's chaos. If you don't understand the meaning of parousia, of end of the age, that day, that coming day, the harvest, then all is chaos because it's a foreign language until you know the meanings of these fundamental words. <laughs> right, you, you 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 cannot have simply put, you cannot have a parousia without a resurrection. That's right. And uh, That's another right. good another good text is First uh, Thessalonians uh, four fourteen. Yes. If we believe mm. that Jesus died and rose again, so also God mm. will bring with Him, with yes. Christ. That is, those who have fallen asleep or yes. those who are dead. Yes. Uh, yes. In Christ, they think. In, in Jesus. Mm. So you cannot have a parousia mm. and a resurrection disconnected from each other. The, no, the one. You cannot. Once you separate. The one. Chaos. Go ahead. That's right. And how does he do that? Well, what he does is to raise them from the dead, catch them up with the living saints, the surviving saints, to meet him in the air, escort him in the direction in which he's going, just as the people went out from Rome to meet Paul in Acts there, and just as the bride, you know, uh, waits and goes out to meet the bridegroom and so on. This is a very easy concept. So Jesus has to raise the sleeping dead, catch them up to meet him, and then they will escort him in the direction which he's going, which is to the earth. The real problem here is that people are 
absolutely mesmerized, infatuated with the idea of going to heaven. Why do you want to go to heaven when Jesus won't be there, would be the question to ask your friends. No, we don't go to heaven when we die. We fall into a state of sleep. We fall asleep. We're in Sheol, the grave, until the resurrection. We're wakened from the sleep of dead. Daniel 12, 2. That's exactly at the same time, or just following, the great tribulation. That's the key. Daniel 12, 1, 2, and 3 is the key to clarity. There's no pre-tribulation rapture there. There's no additional resurrection seven years earlier. That would throw the whole thing into mass chaos. In fact, those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture can't even agree about Matthew 24. Many of them say that Jesus isn't speaking to the church in Matthew 24. What? That would do away with the faith, unfortunately. The words of Jesus are the basis of everything we should believe. Matthew 24 has no pre-tribulation rapture resurrection at all. It's not there. So some try to invent it in the text where it says one will be taken and the other left. But if you look at the text there, that's not pre-tribulation. It's post-tribulation. Others of that school say, no, it's not even there. The preacher rapture is not there in Matthew 24 because that's not even for us that produce. This is mass chaos. We don't need that sort of confusion in a topic uh, about the future, which is so central and massive in the New Testament. And the other thing, uh, just to wrap this up, and uh, we'll go to Robert, who's mm. raising his hand, and then a couple of questions mm. from Facebook, Anthony. But just yes. to add to this, so you cannot have a, a resurrection without a parousia. No. So Correct. you cannot, those two are not disconnected. They, they are never the one event. Mm -hmm. And let me throw Wonder. out a, an interesting passage here by Paul. The other thing mm. you cannot have is a resurrection mm. without all the saints mm. throughout history. Yep. And that includes Saul, the man who became known as Paul. Look at this interesting mm. passage here, Anthony. Philippians 1, mm -hmm. uh, verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. I always pray with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Mm. For I am sure of this very thing. He's very sure, Paul. I am yep. sure of this very thing, right? Yes. The one who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ, Jesus. Ah. That's an interesting uh, phrase by Paul because Paul's hope now is on the day of Christ, not so Good. much on the day of the Lord God or, or the day of God uh, as, as known in the Old Testament. In other words, the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, the Lord God becomes the day of mm. Christ. And then Same he goes, day though, not a different day. The day right. of the Lord is the day of Christ. No separation. It's the right. same event. It becomes known now as yep. the day of Christ. And then verse 7. For it is right for me to think this about all of you, because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation mm. of the gospel, all of you became partners mm. in God's grace together with me. To me, yeah. that sounds almost like code language there. God's grace, yeah. you could say, mm. is his immortality plan. The plan he yeah, has yeah. for Paul and the plan he has for all believers from 2,000 years ago till now and till the future yep. when Christ comes. Yeah. And then if we go to the yeah. famous chapter in uh, the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, at the end yeah. of that chapter, there's another interesting a detail about this whole parousia resurrection. These were all commended for their faith, yet they did not receive what was promised. That's another code language for the immortality yeah. plan. Of course. For God yeah. had provided something better for us so that they would be made perfect together with us. So, Again, you cannot separate resurrection from parousia and the fact is that the resurrection will, will bring about the resurrection of all the saints from all the, mm. the ages, uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. you well, yes, and you that? could also read in Philippians 3, a, a, a good verse to do in Philippians 3 would be, 
But Paul says, if by all means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's beautiful. Isn't that in Philippians 3.11? I think 3.11 probably. Not sure, but I think 3, somewhere, 3.11. Yep. That's what he's aiming at. That's right there. 3.11. 11? Yes, right there. You see it? Right there. I've got 3.9. I've got something else. The window is looking at something else. There it is. Attain to the exanastis is there. There's an interesting ex. It means art resurrection. Might even refer to first resurrection. It is the first resurrection, as we know from uh, Revelation 20. But yes, that's where he's aiming. Not at the moment of his own death. He's going to fall asleep. The resurrection is the only goal. So you drop the language about when I go to heaven at death. Drop that because it's misleading you. Drop the language about so-and-so has passed away or gone on. He hasn't. He's fallen asleep in death. This way we'll put the resurrection, the goal, back in the place where it belongs in all Christian discourse. All right. So okay. we'll bring uh, Robert here online. He's mm. got a question for us. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? A bit low there. Can you? Is your mic? Do you have a... A new computer and I not really use this mic. But, Can you get uh, close? Is it a laptop? Can you get close to the? That? Is that better? A little bit. Go ahead. Yeah, I can. I can. Okay. Hear. Uh, have Anthony discuss uh, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty-nine about being baptized for the dead. <laughs> and I would like to know where that idea of developed or how they came to this. That they oh. the yeah, I've no, I've no idea. Nobody knows that. We'll have to ask Paul. They did <laughs> baptize. Some sometimes they th and they must have thought, well, my relatives were not baptized before they died, so I'll get them. I'll get baptized in their place. I don't think that's anything we should do now. But it it certainly doesn't say why Paul didn't condemn them necessarily. But he doesn't advocate that. So. That's one of those questions you ask at the Messianic Banquet, I think. It's not something we need to do. We need to recommend water baptism always because repent is a command, be baptized is another command. Those are not arguable, negotiable things at all or shouldn't be. But being baptized on behalf of the dead probably means just that. They were doing it hoping that this would cover for their dead relatives. I don't think Paul would have approved of that particularly, but he doesn't explain it and I don't know. Uh, if you've got some more light on it, fine. I don't yeah. know. Well, the reason I ask it, I think there's one large denomination, I will call their name. You yes. Baptized in dead. Yes. That's right. Well, that's absolutely, I think, unnecessary. You're talking about the Mormons. We need to make this clear. The Mormons do that. And for public information, we need to know who's doing what. Otherwise, it's not clear. But the Mormons do believe in that. I think it's completely unwarranted. Nobody else does. Quite unnecessary. There's not enough scriptural basis to make that a valid thing. Why bother? Yeah, I just wanted to came from, you know, somewhere that some... Uh, yeah. It's always interesting to find out how these things get started. Yes. Uh, you'd have to look at the history of Mormonism to see. But, of course, Joseph uh, Smith, isn't it, the uh, originator? Yep. Joseph. The stuff that he got is, frankly, uh, I'm being very polite here, completely suspect. Mm -hmm. Just look at the the story of how he got these reading of hieroglyphs he was an unscholared person un untutored person who was reading hieroglyphs this is the sort of thing you don't want Both to follow tablets. however let's say that the mormons have a very good family life very often they are models of good christian standards in many ways that simply proves that you can be a good person you can have a measure of good high christian standards without getting the truth behind it however i don't recommend you try that you need both because the doctrine, so-called, is just as important as is the Christian living that comes out of it. So I don't recommend that model, but I will give them the credit of at least trying very hard to be good people, and they are. But that theology, though, uh, that you're going to be on a some distant planet at some stage and have multiple wives, Call that it. is, frankly, quite strange. Okay, that, that, that helps a little bit. I, I've yeah. heard your comment here, and I heard your kind of conclusion. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks for the question, Thanks, Robert. Robert. Great. Hope Goodbye. to see you soon. Yep.
Carlos, I got one that came this evening. Can I read it for you? A question? Sure. Yes. Question came, does it matter when or by whom the book of Daniel was written? My Jerusalem Bible, he says, introduces the book of Daniel by saying it was written 167 BC. The question is, witnesses. does it matter? Who does it matter? As he goes on to say, as JWs, we were always taught that it was written by <laughs> Daniel. Uh, but then scholars, he says, cannot accept that. Well, the answer is it flat out does matter critically. It's a falsehood to say that Daniel was not written by Daniel. That would contradict Jesus. It would make Daniel a false prophet. So the unbelieving scholars, what Jeremiah referred to as the lying pen of the scribe, goes entirely wrong when it says that Daniel wasn't written by Daniel. The idea is there that you cannot have prediction. Not really. They don't believe that. So if that's so, then Daniel must be pseudo-Daniel, not the actual Daniel. It must have been a Daniel in the second century BC who was watching all the stuff with Antiochus, Epiphanes, and so on, and simply writing that down as though it were prophecy. That's about as false as you can get. So it matters absolutely that you agree with Jesus, who spoke of Daniel as Daniel the prophet. You remove that from the Bible, you've practically destroyed the gospel, because Daniel is quoted, alluded to, about 200 times in the New, New Testament, massively in the Olivet Discourse. Right. Uh, yeah, it matters because, yeah, if, if we're Christians mm. and we follow Christ, and by following yes. Christ, I mean we um, hold to his teachings. Of yeah, course, automatically, time, that needs to be. In, in Matthew and Mark, he calls Daniel the prophet. And Daniel, yes. of course, in the book of Daniel, Daniel says things like, I, Daniel, blah, 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 yeah. I, Daniel. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah. It's important. Yeah, I would, uh, I would venture to say the devil hates that book. He hates uh, the whole of Scripture. The devil hates the whole of Scripture, but he particularly hates the book of Daniel because Jesus worked out of the book of Daniel. The book of Revelation is largely based on Zechariah and Daniel and ma a mass of prophecies from the Old Testament. So Daniel is absolutely key. I recommend it for your thorough study all the time. Yeah, it's interesting because Daniel is about... Um, the wicked nations it's about the mm. uh, wicked prince of the north the antichrist <laughs> satan's yes. uh, agent yes. so i can see why he he would particularly hate he daniel because it. it details the events of mm. his his agent in the future so uh, last question here anthony yeah. from virginia yeah. warren uh regarding wow. mm -hmm. babylon the great in uh, revelation mm. 18 uh, mm. who or what is it uh, JW say that it's a it represents all false religion Babylon the great in mm. Revelation 18 what's your that's a good interesting question and it certainly could do that uh, I, I tend to want to add this too it's a commercial venture as well Babylon is a commercial venture if you look in in Revelation 18 when Babylon falls, as it finally will, all the merchants and all the traders are terribly upset. So it has a strong commercial uh, aspect to it, phase to it. And that would suggest then a, an economic system. But I'm sure it also has a false religious element. That's the false prophet along with the beast, the man of sin along with the beast. And the man of sin is the beast, I would say. And the false prophet goes along with him. So the religious element is there as well. But it's not just a religious thing. It certainly would contain, I'm sure, all the elements of false religion as well, probably mostly in the false prophet. But it is a commercial venture. That's interesting. The traders and the shipmasters and so on are distraught and weeping when Babylon, the city, and it could be a restored literal Babylon too. That's quite possible. As you know, Saddam Hussein was trying to do that very thing. He called himself the new Nebuchadnezzar. He was trying to reestablish Babylon, the city, as a commercial venture. And that could still happen. I have no dates, of course, at all set. I have no idea when the abomination of desolation finally shows up. Then we will have an idea. Till then, we don't. But Babylon could be restored as a commercial venture, oil-rich. That's entirely possible. Certainly with the religious element added and a world religious system 
combining all the wrong ideas, particularly the anti-Christian spirit of who Jesus is, we must believe in a human Jesus. That's First John 2, 1. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. First uh, John 2, 18, I should say. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. He didn't say it was wrong. Everybody had heard that. All Jews knew about the Antichrist, and that's a proper noun there. You've heard that he's coming. But let me tell you something else. That spirit of Antichrist is already at work in many Antichrists, plural. Both things are true. Don't get rid of one in order to do only the other one. They're both there. So that Antichrist is to do with who uh, Jesus is. It's defined by a Jesus who is fully human. It's no good saying with Luther, where he mistranslated the Bible and said that, uh, that the Son came into the flesh. That's just wrong. He came in the flesh, quite different. He is human, as Matthew one twenty, begotten in her, not into the flesh. No, no, that would be an incarnation with a capital I, and that's quite foreign to the New Testament. So, in flesh, the human Jesus, not the angel Jesus, that wouldn't work either, not the God Jesus, but the Messiah Jesus, Luke 2.11, and the Lord's Messiah in Luke 2.26. All of these are key. Don't forget that the whole book of John was written with this, in a, with this one aim, that you might believe every word of John, including John 1.1, 1, 1, was written that you might believe that Jesus is God. No, 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 no. Never, never, never. Not that he's God, that he's the Son of God, the Messiah. That's exactly the same as the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus says, with many hallelujahs, Peter, you've got it right, on this rock confession that I'm the Messiah, same as John at the end, on that rock confession, I will build my church. That's where we need to get our stakes dug deep into the ground, I think. Right, and, and uh, so Babylon, in terms of uh, the, the Catholic Roman Church, as the early mm. reformers believed, you don't hold to that? Well, I would call it false religion of all sorts. I think that probably there are many daughters, many uh, comparisons and likenesses between Protestantism and Catholicism. And so false religion, but it has a commercial element to it. That's as far as I know. I don't know yet. So watch the Middle East carefully and see what develops there. Oh, we will say this though, Carlos. The yep. man of sin is the Antichrist, is the beast, is the little horn of Daniel 7, Daniel 8. So he comes under many titles. He's also the final king of the north in Daniel 11 from the Syrian government, not from Rome, actually. Rome is not the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2. It's a Middle Eastern thing, not a European thing. So that has been the advance of prophecy studies in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, right. So that's it for today. We'll be back hopefully tomorrow. Uh, I need to confirm this, but we might be back mm. speaking with uh, Peter Carabas. You can find them on Facebook. Mm. That's Peter, the Bible student elder. Uh, we might do a part two, uh, this time focusing on uh, eschatology, parousia, end of the age, and his uh, friends of Jehovah's Witnesses. So it's... it's uh, mm -hmm. Friendly exchange we're having with the Bible students that uh, I don't think yeah. we've had before. I don't know if you if yeah. you have had Anthony. No, but uh, I think it's a ah uh, yes, uh, no, not officially yes, many good learning experience informally yes for mm. both yes. our groups and mm. also folks remember this um, I believe is this this Friday October twenty seven is the anniversary of mm. someone who's very near and dear to me anyway. And that's uh, Michael mm. Servetus. He was burned uh, on October 27, 1553. Mm. So mm. Uh, I will be uh, time allowing Anthony this Sunday doing a little oh, yes. thing uh, sure. during our Sunday, Sunday. service. I call mm. it in, mm. in memory of. But uh, he's a key mm -hmm. figure in, 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 the, um, in the movement that became known as yes. Biblical Unitarianism. And he's also a key figure with, um, with uh, a lot of um, humanists out there who uh, sort of found him in the 1800s. So I'll leave you with a quote from our fallen courageous friend and hopefully brother. Mm. And this is why uh, I think uh, he robbed a lot of people the wrong way. 
since this philosophy, philosophy about three beings entered into the world, scholars have said that there are three gods, because although they denied with their mouth, our brethren confess it in fact. <laughs> so <laughs> that was uh, Miguel yeah. Servet is the Spanish uh, rendering. Uh, very much uh, a man of, of my cloth, I should say. I think uh, I share a lot of uh, characteristics with this guy. He was very blunt and sometimes very, you know, blunt. <laughs> but uh, okay. I think sometimes you need to be in this present evil age. All right, Anthony, thank you. Thanks, everyone. And hopefully we'll yeah. see you back thank at you. 11 a.m. And I'll throw out the link uh, confirming with uh, Peter Caravas. Peter Caravas, good. Good night. Good night.